respected delegates, highly qualified researcher, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to everyone. So the present uh, today we're going to present the topic interplay of archaeological numismatic and heritage sustainability and narrative of care. So the primary understanding that we have taken it's a blend between archaeology and numismatics, the study of coin. And while speaking about the coin, we would take into consideration the object as well. So we have taken a supportive argument to talk about that how the heritage in the country is in is in crisis. And at the same point of time, we would also look into the theoretical framework that is presently in continuous in archaeological practice to bring a blueprint or working hypothesis that could be that could bring in um, a better insightful understanding in reading coin or studying coin that are found from archaeological context. And furthermore, it applies to other objects as well. So to open up the uh, discussion, uh, I would like to change the slide. Yeah. So I like this quote a lot. If there is one history running all down from old Dubai gods to postmodernia, it must be one increasing materiality. And that more and more tasks are delegated to non-human actors, and more and more actions are mediated by things. So let's celebrate the discipline of things. As archaeology or discipline of things, we have been forgetting uh, from uh, some time. We're not thinking about that how thing is important. We have always thought of putting agency onto human uh, connotation that human is everything. But if you see the postmodernia, there is nothing. There is only materiality. All glass buildings. If it if it falls today. All your antiquity would be subdued under nowhere. No one would be able to understand or able to fathom the aspect of antiquity. So let's celebrate the discipline of thing altogether. So we have two operational area, as I said, the theoretical and methodological premise. So I have, uh, like, we have exposed upon symmetrical archaeology, a new concept. It's not an adjective like processual or post processual or social archaeology. It's just in another way to use, not to bring a distinction between human and non-human actor. Let's just bring on a on an ontological plane, which is flat, where you give supportiveness to both of the actant, whether it's a table or whether it's a human. So that is what we're going to look into the uh, symmetrical part, and later on we'll move into uh, the actor network theory. To do so, uh, we have approach the Bruno Latour, actor network theory, and reassembling the social. And at the same time, we have also looked into the phenomenological part, which has been taken from uh, Martin Heidegger, uh, finding thing in itself and finding meaning in itself. And then evocative turn in archaeological rhetoric and cementing symbiotic relation between numismatic and archaeology, and locating symmetry in numismatic practice, or what we say, object-oriented approach. So enactment of coin, a subordinate social agency that how we can give a little bit of understanding that, okay, coin is also a social agency, how we can do that. Because perhaps what we have seen that if you go to a numismatic section, I'm not criticizing or we are not criticizing anyone. If you go to a numismatic section, we'll find cataloging. It's good. We should catalog. But while being in archaeological field, we also understand the context. And that we go away from where it has been found because it has its social aff affordance and social memory and its association and network. It's enmeshed, entrapped somewhere. You have to find it out. And, and it depends on the eye of an archaeologist when they're excavating the site. So the, <clears throat> now, thinking through things and archaeological numismatics. So these are the predominant uh, texts that I have found that writing in this direction. The Norwegian uh, scholars, uh, so far in Indian context, is, it has not been worked. So they are Norwegian scholar. They have been working in this aspect of object-oriented ontology and uh, the exposition to levi byron concept of OOO, object-oriented ontology. So these are the predominant publication. One can go through them if they want to understand more about the social in numismatics or subordinate agents in numismatics. So in the formulative period of archaeology, if you look, the coin has been associated with new methods and ideas, and it has been always used that, OK, we found a coin. It means just label a chronology, set a chronology. In Indian context, if you find a coin, OK, this belongs to 
Gupta. This belongs to Satvahan. But somewhere we forget the subalternity, the people who used it, the people have, you know, the people who used it every day. So we forget the everydayness of the thing. So very numismatic gradually became a highly descriptive and a specialized field in the study has been inst institutionalized with museum, the department of art history, where coins are valued for their artistic and a style, a stylistic representation. It helps archaeological research at a very basic level to set a chronology, as I said, and for excavated archaeological features to understand the economic uh, prosperity. So it has been always seen that economic, economic prosperity and chronology that has been always an understanding while getting numismatic artifacts or any coin that we find. So this was Sijay Thompson's uh, explanation. What specially distinguished coin in general speaking, they admit being fixed and referred to a precise time with much greater accuracy and certainly than any other antiquarian object. The, adopter, uh, the adoption of heritage sustainability agenda in the archaeological numismatic study is indeed a trope that specifically appeals to collective care, ethical behavioral implication, and explicit concern for the protection of cultural heritage property from the hand of antiquity dealer and looters. So now, when we'll move into the second section, which Dr. Uh, Ansari would be discussing, so we'll see that how the escalating or uh, false, false aesthetization that is happening in across the country, where we we will, uh, you know, we will see that how coins are being traded over various e-commerce websites. So that is the area that I have looked into. That how a false aesthetical aesthetical aspect that we are living with, and how we are putting the antiquity, you know, in arm's length. We are not thinking about it. So that's the second section. As truth claims, heritage emerged not as a process conferred with the past or present, but the future-oriented, emergent, contingent, and creative endeavor. It is a symmetrical and symbolic meaning-making process which, in which curation involves not only protecting an object from future generation, rather formulate ontologically connected creative mediation between object, human, and bind them over space and time. So we have to find an ontological plane where we can engage them. The recent ar archeological jade gist and positioning of agency in defense of thing and coming back to the thing. And in symmetrical archaeology, the predominant researcher are Bojoner Olsen, Whitmore, Webmore, and Michael Shank. So in 2007, the first manifesto came of symmetrical archaeology in World Archaeology, World Archaeological Journal. So uh, the, the most importantly, why we chosen symmetrical archaeology, one may ask that why you have chosen symmetry? Because I think it gives us a position or a juncture where we can bring the object into an understanding with agency. We can give a concept of agency to an object as well, to a material as well. That's the most important part. And we must think about it, not always human, it's object. So we have to defend the thing. Now positioning agency. So if, if we go and ask anyone regarding agency, these are the predominant writing that would come up. Baudouin's outline of theory and practice, Anthony Gideon Walk's central problem in social theory, and Latour's reassembling the social and introduction to actor network theory. These are the most predominant writing in agency. Also, Marx has also written, but if you want to grasp of uh, understanding of agency, we have to go through it. But are these agency giving an appropriate concern to the material? That's the big question. <clears throat> Now, one can see these are the five predominant agency approach that mostly used in archeological uh, literature or rhetoric. We'll find them, but all these five uh, approach, agency approach are mostly oriented to bring human onto the stage where human is enacting, where human is playing, but not an object. So, now, turn in agency and what is beyond? Now, if we are supposing that let's just turn to the from agency, let's just bring object into the agency, then what is beyond? What do we do for that? How is it possible to claim non-human or material thing having agency in themselves? And if they have, then what type of agency is it? What led us to accept this newness or connotation that object, it applies to every material construction of human or things? and have potentiality to enact as an actant. 
to become more cautious and arise a very simple question that how this attribution of the agency is materiality is approval even one may tantalize and ask okay how such shift from human agency to object agency can obtain an embodiment of things with a human by maintaining an ontologically justified narrative that must be the question but to think when we see an object uh, the entanglement if you see the entanglement of an object its affordance like coin has not just only been used for the economic purpose when coins come we say okay this has been issued by uh, a sadhavana ruler okay these are the chronology these are we, we are setting chronology according to the finding of coins we are forgetting the layer sometime where it has been found because if uh, present in some some uh, months back we were in, uh, in in maharashtra actually i was in maharashtra i was among the warlies i found a warly lady wearing a necklace even among the bondos in urissa when i was working with dr kanungo showed me the see that's how the object life we have to understand the object life so presently they're using the coin as the necklace it's not having any economical aspects you have to understand this not always economy prosperity but it is about thingness objecthood it is about how it works how people think about the coin now moving towards relational ontological practice a major move in social science now from last 20 years uh, all the scholars are you know into decentralized agency please decentralize the agency now what is that it is coming from uh, bruno latour's work the semiotics of materiality and this symmetry with respect to human and non human every entity participating in a ne network must be explained analytically and people and things should be given equal importance now just positioning our understanding from coin to into a context of indian wedding i think gold gold jewelry is a agent sometime they are human it decide that how marriage going to happen if we think in that object with an objective mind if we think we if we think through materiality we can able to find an answer for it no primacy of the human actor individual collective over the non human actor can be accepted period ground and clarification is not to overcome the traditionally drawn contradiction between agency and structure rather ignore it ant in latour world it's a bypassing strategy if you want to bypass not to give much uh, prominence to human use object ontology or actor find an actor who is enacting in a particular context coins are also found from graves so when it is found from grave the person who is buried it's connected with the coin it's not the king who issued the coin you always go to the subject of authority but look into the subalternity look into the person who used it or may have perceived or may have given some connotation to it to the wealth it could be a memory it could be anything now if you go into anthropological literature marcel mauss gift then nancy mon work among the kula exchange appa durai work among the social life of thing and igor kopitov works that how slave was been object objectified was been an object a human was also object at a point of time how recontextualizing was happening with over the time and space now why symmetry why we need a symmetry concept now we need symmetry because we should give some power to the non human actor like to a coin that i will be coming that how we give the affordance to a particular object that will come on the later part the core of discussion is heterogeneous sometime we uh, what happens we becomes homogeneous with our understanding we don't follow a heterogeneity in our understanding we should open up the mind and we should see that how the entrapment enmeshment is happening though team in goal said that uh, the symmetry is just a uh, old wine in a new bag but somewhere it works somewhere it does work because it's a relatively high time to think that enough of human 
It's just a material. We are defined by our material. Now it's a post-humanistic thinking. We have to look into the post-humanistic thinking. Now I, I believe that uh, Alfred Gill work, um, Alfred Gill work was an important work when, where you get an understanding that how the positioning of agency has been changed. So the coin to be given as an index, fixing Alfred Gill work, art and agency and anthropological theory. So it's a nice reading and where he explained that how we can motivate or mobilize our understanding to bring a secondary agency, a more rational relation, interrelation among the object and human. So he, uh, Alfred Gill talked about the personal, emotional, and symbolic significance, social, economic, and philosophical, religious meaning of any object. And while studying the coin, primarily the notion of an archeologist must behold in a way to know the past through object introducing cross-cultural comparison, phenomenological experience, even contextual interpretation of local meaning, apart from it necessary to integrate a hermeneutic perspective to bring other things in detail of a relation. So it's a coin found from a localized cultural code. We have to find that where the coin or any object are there in which context. That is the most important. It's coming from post-processualism. It's coming from the contextual approach and which we have also seen in harder work of entanglement theory where it's trying to develop an understanding of human depends on thing, things depend on thing, which somewhere is a work of um, like, it's a mesmerized work, but at, at the same time, it's already uh, there in actor network theory in a more nuanced manner. Now, how we contextualize the object to objecthood of a coin? So there are three contexts. We must think that a coin can be found or a hoard can be found or any object can be found. There are three contexts. What is the primary context? The primary context is largely connected to the process of minting, production, relation, origination. It also provides information on craftsmanship, technicality applied in minting, and regulation in minting, and nature of iconographic depiction with perceived agenda and intentionality, workshop, organization, and economy. This is the primary context. Now, what is the secondary context? Secondary con context en encompasses usability, reusability, transfer, alteration, which coin encounters. It also includes the user acceptance of the coin and the reception of iconographic and logistic of trade and tax collection and sacrifice. Now in the secondary context, why it is important? Because there is a term called extra numismatics, which deals with the primitive money. So there were time when primitive money was in control, was in, in, in a flow within the society. And in the other part, there was some currency, metal currency. But the people who just used or wore this coin as a, for their beautification, but at the same point of time, there was some other primitive money. So their economic exchange were happening. It happened, but they didn't consider about any metallic coin or any uh, issued by any authority. So that's the secondary context that you have to think about. Now the tertiary context, the depositional unit, which is very close to the archeologist. It's a depositional unit where it has been found and recovered. The depositional unit of a coin has its variability and is often situational. Perhaps it can be particular cultural phase or layer. It can be grave, it can be temple, it can be church, and in any social space related to human. Moreover, the certain cases, this disposition is in, 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 intentional, which serves many purposes. And such purposes directly something portray the social and cultural affiliation of people and individual. So this third or the tertiary context is very close to the archeologist. When archaeologists gave it, we should not take out to understand the chronology. Rather, we put an understanding and made our mind into work and thinking through the things that how it happened, what perhaps been the affordance, the social affordance, the interconnectivity. Now, there are four themes that we developed. The fourth theme of coin that is subordinate social agency, SSA. So coin can be articulated as a subordinate social agency when we have ample evidences 
to define that how this affordance can be juxtaposed or justified or contextualized and reinvented through the archaeological disposition. So that is called SSA, Subordinate Social Agency. And there are four themes in it. The first theme is, uh, first theme of SSA is feelings that sometime we find coin in a, or any object apart from the metal value, apart from, uh, it evokes some trust, it evokes some understanding. So earlier we have scrutinized and contemplated that human object entrapment, which has been found in both of them in continuous process of dialogue with a diet relation. An object is an essential aspect, locate, locate human interaction and where the action was probably shaped. And there's a continuous flow of reciprocal effect of human action, intention, and incumbent in the creation of object. Similarly, the coin is an intentional human creation and it's, it has various usability, purposes, and human fleeing are deeply concerned with them. So coin has affordance of feelings. We can find it out. They have an image, they have culture, a color, they have text, and they have other visual representation of the coin that gives a feeling of the subject or the consensus they should, or it has been perceived among. So that's the feeling we call feeling. We should contextualize within the feeling. Now belongingness. So belongingness is, it belongs to a local, regional, tribal, national identity based on the depiction of the coin. It's called belongingness. We say they belong to somebody, they belong to some group of people, they belong to some consensus. <clears throat> Third is acting, that how it acts. So if we find it in a grave, so it acted as a, uh, the, the ceremony after the death, as a wealth. So there are various in, instances that we'll find that how they're acting. Uh, actually, I'm running out of the time. And then creating, the creating, we intended to clarify how coin has been used for various dispositional purpose over time and space in different contexts from majority of the religious center grave coin are found and accumulation of such piece of evidence are possibly important to understand the long-term use of coins. So they're giving a creating, they're creating a message, they're creating an understanding and they're moving from town to town. They're moving across the geography. We have to think about this creation of identity or creation of, 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 of the memory that is very important. Now what I ask Dr. Uh, Ansari to present the second operational area that is heritage sustainability. Good afternoon to all of you, uh, respected chairperson, uh, fellow delegates and participants. Uh, so we are, I think so running out of the time, isn't it, sir? Yeah, so, so in the earlier section, we have discussed the enactment of coins as subordinate social agency this section gives a greater attention to the long-standing heritage issue, uh, mainly focusing upon the commercial commodification and illicit, tra illicit trade of ancient Indian coins over the internet market. Then even more significantly for overcoming this cultural heritage uh, fragility and socio-historical memory crisis, we set forth certain sustainable solutions uh, towards a better um, heritage management. Okay. So we'll uh, look into the legal framework. Uh, now we all know about UNESCO and its convention. Um, uh, it was introduced in four, on 14th November, 1970. And it has become a modern datum uh, for international efforts aim to reducing illicit trafficking in archaeological finds and destruction of archaeological sites, and to address the problem of fraudulently exported and imported cultural objects. This convention broadly articulated the definition of a cultural property uh, as enumerated under Article 1. Um, I will not be going into further details on this. This is very much there in the article. Now we will look into uh, 1974. Now after this particular uh, convention came, uh, certain, many countries uh, started adopting it. So did a uh, Nairobi convention uh, on World Customs Organization. And India, what we see is that 
that uh, by seeing the global efforts, uh, the Indian constitution has also introduced and reconfigured its legal framework, further implicated different measures uh, with con consensus uh, for evaluating and reducing the illicit trade, illicit trade of cultural object. And so we have um, a bill passed uh, in, in the parliament in 1972. Uh, on the Antiquities Export Control Act of 1947, and it came to be known as the Antiquities and Art Treasure Act of 1972, along with rules which came into force with effect from 5th April 1976. Now, this act exclusively talks about two cultural property. Uh, we have Antiquities and Art Treasure Act. So, Art Treasure is something which is like the living, and the Antiquities a uh, number of series of points are there in this act and uh, basically this act provides the op operational guidelines for compulsory registration regulation of the export trade prevention smuggling of uh, uh, fraudulent uh, dealing of antiquity and compulsory acquisition now we are uh, doing uh, this particular uh, talk because we should know as to when we are going to discuss on the internet space uh, how uh, things are getting sold in the market like um, let's go ahead and see how it is happening uh, we do also have custom act 1962 um, by which uh, the government has uh, you know managed to get certain cultural heritage items successfully uh, like uh, some some of which is of national interest, like the Bodhya Buddha and the sculpture of Krishna Janma and uh, bronze Natraj image um, and the dancing Shiva. Now uh, we move ahead and we look into the heritage issue and the modern crisis. Now in recent decades, the scale of illegal trade of cultural heritage objects has sharp, uh, sharply escalated. Such a prolific expansion of this global trading network is possible because of the internet connectivity and digitization across the world. Even various scholarly works illustrated the organized criminal activities involved in antiquities trade and also highlighted legal, ethical, and political issues which are erupting with a continuity of this unlawful act. Overall, the internet market has shifted the nature of the antiquity market, shifted, uh, and caters to antiquity collectors across a broad spectrum. Now, I'll just uh, skip this, and you can see the, uh, the list of sites. Uh, alongside the continuous existence of e-commerce sites like eBay, vCoins, um, others offering platforms uh, which enables uh, the private collectors and private companies to sell antiquities directly to the buyers. And those selling with virtual galleries on different websites can be termed as internet dealers. And those involved in auction is known as inter internet auctioneers. We subsequently operated a quick survey on the Google search engine as well as over Instagram and Facebook social media platform uh, with integrating keywords, uh, searches like ancient Indian coins for sale, Indian antique coins for auction, and collected a random samples of 14 different online website hosting auctions like this. Now, these trading platforms are offering a private transaction uh, through auction, a uh, more traditional business, uh, even broadly enhanced with connectivity between dealers and buyers from various socio-economic and geographical backgrounds, despite having all the laws. While most of the antique co coins are in sale over these platforms, lack clarification. Upon the fine spot, like for example, the provenance uh, description, ownership and trading history of the object, in addition to that, many of the e-commerce platforms and individual dealers fail to furnish legal permits necessarily sectioned under the cultural heritage provision by the national legislation of India. Thus, it is very complicated and 
mostly becomes obscure in co correctly identifying whether those coins are illegally exported, stolen, fake, or unauthentic production. We anchored our discussion upon the information conveyed by the Indian news agency. This is an interesting read. Now on August, um, on August uh, 4, no, 4, 2019, we, in Times of India, uh, there is an article published, a fake or fortune technology, e-stores and weak legislation help the counterfeit coins industry mint money. Now, this particular article gives a disclosure as to uh, scams, counterfeit scams, which uh, is highlighted in this article uh, on Shivrai uh, counterfeit scams, on, on the British India uh, Mohur counterfeit uh, scams. So there is a lot of information on this particular article. So it's not that the people are not understanding this particular issue. They know about it. And there are people who are into, you know, who were part of like dealing on the internet have, you know, like, for example, there is a mention uh, of Manish Khanna. Uh, he is a Mumbai based coin collector who turned into an anti confit crusader. Now, eventually he started collecting and documenting fake coins. Also handles a fake book page, Vigilant Numismatics, to aware people regarding counterfeit and fake coins. Now, yeah, see, this is how it is, screenshot one and two. This is, uh, even you can also go and uh, type, I want to buy coins, you can do it. Uh, being archaeologists, this is kind of very painful to see on the website that what we are studying, what we are teaching to the students as to the prominence and the importance of our cultural heritage and the way these things are like openly sold in the market, uh, the process of commodification of illegal trade of coins over social media platforms. Okay, now it is perhaps the right it is uh, perhaps the right time to ask more fundamental questions here. How potentially and creatively through a well-formulative commemorative act, we can able to address the issue of expanding the illegal trade of antique Indian coins over the online marketplace at the domestic level. How do we bring some sustainability in cultural heritage management through ethical practice and policy implication, we should envisage heritage as a cultural thread of sustainability, not only as an issue of preservation, but of creation, adaptation, and resilience on change. So we thought about a policy formulation and we came up with uh, two ideas, uh, model investigatory protocol. Now, it is uh, referring to the India's enforced legislation of safeguarding the cultural heritage of the nation, primarily concerning the illicit trade of the cultural property over online platform, the Antiquities and Art Treasure Act of 1972, and even the Information Technology Act 2000, amended in 2008, and recently implemented uh, the Information Technology uh, this is another act which has come up very recently in 2021 and it you know we should have it, it introduces uh, a separate legal framework section uh, concerning to to growing business of cultural property over the internet market and recommend uh, recommends um, many ideas to us um, sorry <laughs> i misplaced this Okay, so okay. okay, initially the first, first step which we could think of was to improve the market condition. All the selling website uh, should be uh, encouraged to provide a clear statement. So basically is that that we there can be, uh, this is an article which we have submitted uh, to, um, to Dr. Kanungo, 
where we have clearly mentioned given the points by which we can you know uh, kind of uh, create an awareness uh, among uh, among the archaeological uh, people and also uh, related to the community uh, knowledge you know how to spread this particular knowledge to the people who are actually buying these things so this cultural heritage awareness is very important and this can be you know, uh, uh, done through edu educational programs. And um, as, sir, should I close? It? Okay. So the implication of educational program, um, now for the team which we were <laughs> thinking of, then, then the, the team has to be multidisciplinary, where you have the archaeological survey of India, anthropological survey of India, museum department, crime investigation bureau, uh, custom department, judiciary department, and respective NGOs to come together to resolve this transitional crime at the domestic le level. It seems cooperation with the international agencies is indeed necessary here for curbing down the heritage crisis. Now, um, educational programs, the implication of educational program, which we can uh, think of uh, basically, it em emphasizes uh, pedagogical tools involving uh, public archaeological discourses uh, in a prime medium to bring awareness among the citizen regarding illegal trade, counterfeit, uh, trafficking, and looting of cultural property, promoting and teaching the importance of contextual information, ethical and thoughtful behavior towards the non-renewable cultural property, and improvising the uh, perspective of people on the meaning and value of preserving the past should be a necessary concern to bring advocacy of cultural stewardship, preservation, and conservation. Similarly, students should be encouraged to take part in heritage research for uh, creating a sustainable and resilient future for society. Indeed, in the era of digitization, where various awareness uh, raising campaigns can be oriented through visual media like video, documentary, and films over internet and social media platform. Such procedure would surely broaden the understanding of people about what exactly means to be responsible citizen and also heighten the value of cultural heritage and archaeological resources in their ha ha heart and mind. Can you conclude? Thank you. So to conclude, we have seen the two phases in a direct relation. One, you're finding where there is an aesthetic, uh, false aesthetic, aesthetical understanding and uh, false memorization of the past. And on the other side that we are finding that coins are just been taken for chronological marker, not been given justice to understand the, what the social affordance they might have been. So these are the two areas. Then I would go into a story which I like most. I would not read it out. It's a story of care from being and time by Martin Heidegger. So in, in this juncture at, this, at the present moment, what we need is that we need a care for the subject. We need a care for the cultural heritage. And I hope this is straight, straightforwardly goes uh, from the heart of theory of uh, subordinate social agency to unsettling archeology span that we need care. And I, I just want to take some one, uh, one, two minute to read this story because it's a nice story. Uh, so once when Care was crossing a river, she saw uh, some clay and she thoughtfully took a piece and began to shape it. While she was thinking about what she had made, Jupiter came by. Care asked him to give it spirit and this, uh, and this he gladly granted. But when she wanted her name to be bestowed upon it, Jupiter forbade this and demanded that it be given his name instead. While Care and Jupiter were arguing, Earth arose and desired that her name to be conferred upon the creature since she had offered it part of her body. They asked Saturn to be the judge and Saturn gave them the following decision, which seemed to be just, since you, Jupiter, have given it spirit, you should receive that spirit at death and since you art have given its body, you shall receive its body. But since care first shaped this creature, she shall possess it and lo as long as it's alive. 
So, and because there is a dispute among you to its name, let be called Homo, for it made out of humus, earth. So we human are predetermined. We are, we, we are ingrained with care. We, ca we care about each and everything. So why can't we care about the object that we use, the material that we use? Why can't we see the affordance? In the second section that we found, that how the business, the escalating business over there, media, social media like Facebook, Instagram, it's C to C, consumer to consumer, sometimes B to C, business to consumer. And there are counterfeits. And this is not what Walter Benjamin said in 1980 when he was, uh, Walter Benjamin as a German critic, he used to, he, he wrote at the point of time that there would be a day would come in the world that there would be only glass building and heritage would not be asked for anything. So right now we think that this Martin Heidegger being in time, a story of care is most, most important for our attainment and to understand that how we could bring better justification to the practice of archeology, span to the practice of anthropology and to the practice of humanity. And that's the most important part. So at the end, I will say from postmodernia to from old Dubai gods to postmodernia, there is nothing, there is only materiality. So we should take care of thing because archeology span is a discipline of thing. Thank you.